Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for social isolation and well-being for caregivers. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at Family Caregiver Alliance and your co-host. Social isolation and well-being for caregivers is a second in a series of webinars focusing on caregiving during the COVID-19 coronavirus emergency. These webinars are a collaboration between Family Caregiver Alliance and the San Francisco Department of Disability and Aging Services. Next week's webinar will cover COVID-19 and caring for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. These webinars are on Thursdays from three to four Pacific time. Now, if you haven't heard about Family Caregiver Alliance briefly, we do research and advocacy for caregivers as well as support services. We have a number of fact sheets, webinars, blog articles, and online classes for caregivers. We also offer direct services and counseling to family caregivers in five counties of the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, before I turn things over to our co-presenter, I'd just like to mention we'll be doing question and answer at the end of this webinar, and we'll answer as many questions as we can during that time. So now I'd like to turn things over to today's co-presenter, Luciana Tsai, at the San Francisco Department of Human Services, specifically the Department of Disability and Aging Services. Thanks, Calvin. And I'd like to also thank the Family Caregiver Alliance for thank taking the time to co-sponsor these educational webinars with San Francisco's Department of Disability and Aging Services. The goal of these webinar series is to provide education and information to caregivers and recipients of caregiving to support them in sheltering in place and staying safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now here's Calvin to introduce today's presenter. So I'd like to welcome my colleague, Christina Irving. Christina is the Client Services Director at Family Caregiver Alliance. She oversees the staff of the Bay Area Caregiver Resource Center who provide direct services to family caregivers, including assessment, counseling, education, and also support. She's been with FCA for over 13 years, first as a family consultant and then as a clinical supervisor. She received a master's degree in social work from San Jose State University and is a licensed clinical social worker. So now that you know a little bit more about Christina, I'd like to turn things over to her. Great. Thank you, Calvin, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Um, you know, this is a pretty important topic right now, given how difficult it is for everybody, but especially for caregivers. And so we really want to provide you with some resources, some support, and hopefully some tools that will help you both cope with caregiving during the COVID-19 pandemic and find that support for yourself so that you can focus on your own well-being as well as that of the person that you're caring for. Many of the challenges that caregivers are facing right now are not totally new, but they just may be a little harder to deal with. Um, it's not uncommon for caregivers to be juggling multiple roles, but now instead of just working from outside of the home, you might be working from within the home um, while you're caregiving. You might also be trying to homeschool your children while you're caregiving. And so it's just making it a little bit harder. Um, we know that there is a huge financial impact on, for caregivers because of caregiving. You know, costs of co-pays and medications and home care. And again, this is something that we're seeing even more so right now because some people are also losing their jobs. Um, you might be caring for someone who has some dementia or some cognitive impairment, maybe also some mental health issues, and so you're dealing with challenging behaviors in sometimes very small little spaces. Um, and there's a lot right now that we can't control. A lot of things that we have no ability to change or to make things better, and that can lead to some feelings of powerlessness and hopelessness and create a lot of stress. And so we need to figure out how are we going to manage this and how are we going to get through that right now. Stress, again, very common for caregivers in general, um, probably a little bit more so in the moment. And everyone experiences stress a little bit differently. What's really important is to know how you experience stress. And when we talk more about coping mechanisms in a little bit, we'll refer back to it. Um, for some people, it's the anxious thoughts and the worry, and it might be hard to just quiet down your brain for a little bit. 
or you might be somebody who gets a lot of stomach aches or shoulder pain. Um, you might notice that you're stress eating more or you have trouble sleeping or you're just a little bit more irritable and cranky with everyone around you. Um, so knowing how you tend to experience stress is really helpful because it can help guide you in finding things that are going to help you relieve that stress and cope with it. And none of this makes the problems that we're dealing with go away. It doesn't change the fact that you're caring for someone who has a chronic health issue or a progressive condition. Um, it doesn't change the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic and there's a lot of fear and worry. But the goal is to find ways to cope with it. For us to figure out how do I deal with this um, and, and manage so that it's not impacting your health and well-being. And so what we're really looking at doing is trying to build up resilience. And one of the definitions of resilience is that it's the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. And that's definitely what we're dealing with right now. Um, there are both threats to health, um, and this is a significant source of stress. So we want to figure out how do we cope with it? It doesn't mean that these things don't bother us doesn't mean that it's not still hard to deal with, but it's how do we bounce back and recover from them. Um, so we're going to touch on these different things today about how do we help develop healthy thoughts and creating connection and purpose in our life, as well as seeking help and fostering wellness. Um, and the goal of all this, again, is not to make everything go away, not to pretend that things aren't difficult and hard, but to find ways to get through it. And we're really going to start with the healthy thoughts, because how we think about our circumstances has a huge impact on how we cope with it, emotionally how we feel, physically how we feel, and how well we're able to navigate through it. Um, so this is a quote by a woman who took care of her husband during cancer, and she said, you can't control the situation, but you need to think clearly to understand how to navigate it. Again, we're dealing with a lot that we can't control right now, but the more we can develop ways to think through things in, in more positive ways, in more healthy ways, the easier it's going to be for us to navigate and get through it to the other side. Um, we're hearing a lot from caregivers about just increased feelings of anxiety and worry. Not really a new experience for a lot of caregivers. Um, when you've got somebody who might have had a stroke or has Parkinson's or has multiple health issues, there's a lot you're often probably worried about. Um, but again, we're seeing that even more so right now. And those anxious thoughts really have an impact on how well we can make decisions, how well we sleep, um, how kind of patient we are with somebody else. So the more anxious we are, the harder it is just to get through the day. And so we want to try and find ways to manage that anxiety um, so it doesn't control us. And the first step to that is trying to figure out what are those unhelpful thought patterns that we have and how do we address them. So there's a number of different unhelpful thought patterns, but a couple that we're hearing from many caregivers right now are overgeneralizing and then the I shoulds. So overgeneralizing is when we are taking usually something negative and thinking that's it. That's the sum total of, of life right now. So everything is horrible. Nothing's going to get better. Nothing is going well. And we need to step back and think, is that really true? Yes, there's a lot that is really difficult and hard and sad and scary right now. But are there even moments when things feel a little bit better? Are there moments where you still experience joy and pleasure and happiness? And it doesn't mean that we discount all the rest of it, but we want to find those things that bring us some joy and pleasure in our life and make sure that we're not ignoring those. I'll talk more about the shoulds in a moment, but we all have those. I should have been able to get more done today. Um, I should have been more patient. And again, we need to think about, is that really true? Is that true of everything? The trouble with trying to change our thoughts is that a lot of times we're not really aware of them. 
they can be very unconscious, but they still have an impact on how we behave and how we feel. So taking a step back, if you're having a moment where you're feeling very anxious, very worried, very stressed, and trying to think about what's going on in my head right now? What are the thoughts that are coming to me? And write them down and look at, do these feel accurate? Is this real? Is this actually what's true? Um, or is this something that I might be able to reframe and say, yes, there's a lot of things that are really hard and horrible right now, but I had a really nice call from my sister the other day, or mom and I got to enjoy watching this movie together, and that was nice. Um, or maybe I was able to complete these tasks that I needed to, um, either at work or in the house. So paying attention to what is going well can be really helpful in changing those thoughts that just create more anxiety and stress in our lives. Um, and focusing on what you can control, that you can practice safe behaviors, you can, um, you know, again, pay attention to your thoughts and change those, that you can do things that are healthy for you, but not trying to control the things that are outside of our ability to control. That tends to make us feel more worried more anxious um, when we have that sense of powerlessness. So focusing on what are the things that I can do that will make my life better or make this day easier or make me feel safer. And sometimes to do that, it means, especially right now, that we need to limit how much news we're listening to. You want to be aware and, and keep informed, but you might not want to have the TV or the radio on all day long. Um, this probably isn't good for you. It's probably also not good for the person that you're caring for. So think about setting a time during the day when you are going to you know, go online um, and look at the news or watch some sort of news broadcast, however you get your news, but to limit it so that you're not hearing it constantly. And sometimes no matter how well you do all of these things, it can be really helpful to talk to somebody else. Again, it's hard to notice and pay attention to those auto, automatic thoughts that we're having. And sometimes even if we do notice it, we don't always know how to change it. What do I do differently? How do I reframe this in my own head? Um, so sometimes talking to a therapist or a counselor can be really helpful because they can help mirror back what they're hearing and they might be able to help you reframe that. There has been an expansion of the availability of telehealth, and so that means accessing healthcare or mental health services by video chat or by phone. So even if it wasn't available before, it might be available now. So you don't necessarily have to get out of your house to be able to talk with somebody. And then sometimes what we need to do to manage our anxiety is just to stop for a moment and breathe. When we're anxious, we tend to take very shallow breaths and quick breaths, and sometimes we're not breathing at all. So there's lots of relaxation and breathing exercises out there. Um, this is a really simple one. So if you just take a moment and take a deep breath in and then let it out. And the more we practice this during the day, the more it's going to help us kind of calm our thoughts, calm our body, and it's going to help us get back into all these challenging things that we're dealing during the day. I mentioned the shoulds, um, and again, thoughts and feelings are really connected. And the more we have these thoughts of I should, the more those thoughts can lead to feelings of guilt. And so it might be I should have stopped my mom from going outside um, and going to the grocery store. I should be more patient when dad with dementia asked the same question for the 50th time that day. Uh, I should be able to get all my work done, even if they're calling me and needing something um, from the other room and wanting my attention, or I should be able to make more visits. The problem with all the shoulds is sometimes these are things that are outside of our control. And sometimes there are things that we feel like we need to do to be that kind of perfect good caregiver. And those are usually unrealistic. 
sometimes this is more than we are going to be able to do. And the more we try and think about those things that we think we should be able to do, even if it's not possible for us, the more guilt we'll feel, the more anxiety we'll feel, the more helpless we'll feel. So taking a step to think about those shoulds and is there something within your control and what are the things that you need to let go of? So if I think I should be able to stop my mom from going to the grocery store on her own, can I do that? I can maybe change how I communicate with her, let her know my worries, have that conversation, but at the end of the day, that might not be something that I can control. So if we change how we think about it, it helps us differentiate the, between the difference uh, between guilt and regret. So guilt is, this is something I have control over and I've done something to harm or offend another person. And then it might be a good emotion because it tells us that I need to make amends. I need to say I'm sorry or apologize because there was something that I have control over that I did wrong. But regret is the sorrow we feel about things that are outside of our control. So I feel sorrow and regret over this pandemic that we're in and that there are safety issues that people are experiencing. I feel sorrow and regret that I need to still work and still take care of kids and still try to care give. And I'm not going to be able to give 100% attention to all of those at the same time. So there's only so much I have control over. And then there's certain things that I have to realize I'm not going to be able to do not for lack of caring or trying, but just because they're not realistic. And so if we reframe how we think about it, it can help us over time let go of that a little bit. So that's one of the first parts of resilience is how do we change how we think about these circumstances that we're in and does it make it easier for us to cope with them? And then we also need to think about those connections and those relationships. Isolation is unfortunately very common for caregivers. You can't get out as easily, um, you don't have as much time, not everyone in your life understands what you're going through. And again, this is an even bigger issue right now for caregivers and for everybody as people are in the shelter in place. And so sometimes we end up feeling abandoned by those that we thought should support us and should stick with us. Um, or you may not know what are the resources that are available? How do I even ask for help from somebody? Um, and then a lot of times we see, you know, not everybody in the family is on the same page. Not everyone agrees with how things should be done. And then we just don't have the time to see friends and family anymore. And right now you can't even get out to see them should you have time. So how do we cope with it is finding other ways to build connections. Setting up times regularly to have phone calls or video chats with friends or family members so that you don't lose those connections. They don't always have to be long calls. Sometimes the shorter ones actually will be more meaningful and less draining for you, but to maintain those relationships. There are a lot of caregiver support groups out there. Um, many of the ones that used to meet in person have transitioned to being offered either by phone or by video. Um, so good to reach out to any of the community groups because they might still be available. But there are also some good online support groups. So FCA's website, caregiver.org, we have a couple of email-based groups. The Alzheimer's Association, if you're caring for someone with dementia, has a online discussion group. Um, I know a number of caregivers who have found Facebook groups that are sometimes geographically oriented, other times by age, and they've found really great connections that way. Um, outside of caregiving, there might be certain hobbies or activities that you really enjoy, but there might be a community group or a senior center in your neighborhood that does that type of programming, and you might find that that is now online. And so those connections, those relationships are really important right now to build because they're things that kind of give us energy back. You're giving out a lot of energy during the day, and so it's finding those relationships that are nurturing and fulfilling for you, and how do you maintain those? And that really connects to that idea of needing to have meaning and purpose in our lives. And we can find that sometimes with caregiving, 
but you might also find that there's things outside of caregiving that are important that you want to make sure that you're connecting to. Um, the challenge that we experience is that there's a lot of loss that comes with caregiving. There's a lot of grief. And this is really amplified right now with the amount of loss of life that we're seeing and fear. And you know, so we think about grief and loss with caregiving, and, and we tend to think about grief being related to death. And right now, you might be experiencing that, grieving somebody who has died, whether it's from um, COVID-19 or just from another health issue. But there's also grief outside of death. And this quote says, when you have any kind of change, you often have loss. And when you have loss, you have grief. So you may be dealing with grief around the, the losses that you see coming. If here's somebody with a progressive chronic health issue and you see this decline over time, so you're anticipating what might be coming next. And especially now, you might be even more worried about what if they go out? What if they don't stay home and allow me to pick up their groceries or have them delivered? Are they going to get sick? Are they going to die? So we're just compounding all that fear and that worry about what happens as somebody with health issues or somebody who's an older adult and is more vulnerable, and we see just decline normally, and we're even more worried about it now. And then there's this idea of ambiguous loss. Sometimes it's the idea that somebody is there, but they're not the same person they used to be because of dementia, because of other health issues. It's not who they were before. And maybe our relationship with them isn't the same as it was before. And so we need to shift our thinking from this either or, that this person is in my life or they're not, um, that I you know, am still a caregiver and somebody who has my own interests and my own life and my own relationships. And then it's both of those things, that it's not one or the other. And what that does is it helps us realize what are the things that we have to let go of because they are lost and they are gone and we need to grieve them. And what are the things that we can still hold on to? And that brings us to this place of acceptance. So if you've heard of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and the stages of grief, um, this is somebody who did a lot of work with her. And he wrote in a recent article talking about the pandemic and this idea that we are grieving right now for what our life used to look like just two months ago. Um, and he says, acceptance, as you might imagine, is where the power lies. We find control in acceptance. I can wash my hands. I can keep a safe distance. I can learn how to work virtually. We need to find what are these things that we can do. Those are the things that will help us cope and manage with caregiving, with a pandemic, with work, with kids, with everything else in your life. It's to figure out what are the things that I can control and what are the things that I have to let go over because I'm not gonna be able to manage them and I'm not gonna be able to fix it. And it's that idea of resilience. I can't stop all this stuff from happening, but how am I gonna bounce back for it is where I can find that power, where I can find that control and what are the things that I can do. And that's what's gonna help me cope and move forward. Um, and that's not easy to do when we're worried about somebody else's health and well-being. Um, to say that some of that stuff is outside of my control and I can't do anything about it but trying to change those things that we can't control often feels like hitting our heads against a wall and it doesn't tend to get us anywhere. So we really wanna focus on what are those things that I can do? Um, and that will help us get to a place that gives us a little bit more sense of balance in our life. And so thinking about what are the things that I can do? What are the ways that I can be proactive that might help me with some of those thoughts of anxiety and stress and worry um, is putting documents and plans in place. One of the things that we have always heard from caregivers, but definitely a lot more now, is what happens if something happens to me, if I get sick, if I die? And this is not a new concern for caregivers, 
but it's definitely a more real concern right now. Um, and so you want to think about, okay, what can I do? What can I put into place? Doesn't mean it's not still a scary thought, but I might be able to lower my anxiety a little bit if I know I've done what I can. And so some of us are having sort of legal documents in place. And we often think about, okay, I need to have these for the person I'm caring for, or my parents should have an advanced directive because they're older. And it's really, no, 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 everybody should have them because yes, right now, maybe they're at higher risk, but it doesn't mean that any one of us couldn't get sick. Even forget COVID-19, it doesn't mean that some, somebody can't you know, get hurt in another injury or illness. Um, any of those things can happen. And so we wanna make sure we have these documents in place that says who can make health decisions for me if I can't speak for myself. And it gives me a chance to say what I would want or not want. And there will be a, a webinar down the road that will talk more about advanced care planning. Um, but these are really important things to, to get in place, again, both for yourself and for the person that you're caring for. Um, if there are more serious health issues, you may also want to talk to the doctor about a physician order for life-sustaining treatment. In some states, it's called a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. So it's a supplement to an advanced health care directive. Um, but really good to have in place. And those two documents are one that you would definitely do with the doctor. Um, beyond having that, think about gathering some of your personal health information together. Again, for you and the person you're caring for. So a current medication list, um, doctor and your health insurance information, your health history. So if you've had any major surgeries or illnesses, um, you've got allergies, Put all that stuff together so that if they got sick and you weren't able to go with them to the hospital, you would have that information ready to go so that the treating healthcare professional would know that. They would have access to it right away. They wouldn't have to wait for anything to get sent over. They would have the current information. And if you got sick, then it's something that could go with you. So you want to have those documents. You also want to make sure that somebody else knows where they are because it doesn't really do anyone any good if it's sitting in a file cabinet um, or a safe somewhere and nobody knows it's there. So think about who are those backup people that even if they can't step in and take over care, they would at least be able to share that information with the appropriate people. The other thing we've been hearing a lot from caregivers is, well, what happens if mom falls or, you know, just her current chronic health condition gets worse? Um, or there are some new symptoms that I don't think are COVID, but just something's not quite right. And normally I would take her to the doctor or I would take her to the emergency room. And now that may not be an option or definitely not a safe option. Reach out to your treating physicians and find out what are my telehealth options. What would we do if we see some symptoms that we're concerned about, or there's a fall or an injury, or just something comes up that we're not gonna be able to get out and see you, how do we connect with you? So know what those resources are ahead of time so that you don't, in that crisis moment, have to try and figure it out. Like you know, is there an emergency line or urgent care line within your medical group? Do you need to call 911? Um, can they see you by video or are you going to need to go in somewhere? So ask those questions now and put that information somewhere that you can get to, again, should there be a crisis or a change in someone's health and you do need to consult with a doctor, you know what those resources are. Um, we also want to look at what are those community supports. Too often caregivers will say, well, I'm doing okay, I'm managing, I've got, I think I'm doing okay right now, but if things change, then yes, I will reach out for more help and support later. Now is definitely not the time to say, let me wait and see. Um, we are seeing an increased need and use of a lot of our community and social support, which is great. And I think a lot of agencies and programs are really trying to meet that need, but they're also adapting. So 
the likelihood of there being some wait lists or some time before you can get access to services might be higher. So again, start reaching out to them now um, so that you're aware of what's available if you need it. There are also some crisis services that are available. So if you were to get sick and there isn't a backup person, there's no other family or friends who could step in and help take care of your loved one, you might need to call Adult Protective Services, um, which is a county program that provides you know, some support and guidance and getting care in place. Um, if there is an older adult or a dependent adult who is you know, sometimes abused or neglect, but also who maybe just needs care that is not available. So you getting sick and going into the hospital, if there's no one else to take care of this person, that might be a time that they would be able to help get other services and care in place. If you're just feeling stressed and overwhelmed and you just need somebody to talk to given the pandemic and the worry and the anxiety, um, there is a disaster distress helpline that is a federal program through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services. If you're caring for someone with dementia, the Alzheimer's Association has a 24-hour helpline. The Friendship Line is a crisis line specifically for older adults. And so that can be a place to get emotional support when you need it. If you live in California, anywhere you live, there is a caregiver resource center that serves you. So Family Caregiver Alliance is the caregiver resource center for the Bay Area, but throughout California, there is a caregiver resource center. Um, if you live in other states, Elder Care Locator is a way to find your area agency on aging, and that's where you'll find information about adult protective services, about maybe Meals on Wheels programs or home care programs. Um, so that's where you can find some of those other services that you might not think you need, but might be good to know about if it's something that you're kind of concerned or worried about or you think you might need more support on. Um, Calvin mentioned briefly a little bit about Family Caregiver Alliance. I do want to just share a little bit about our website and how to get information. Um, we have a lot of online education and videos and fact sheets and there's webinars um, that have been recorded in the past. And then also Care Journey, which offers some tailored and personalized information and resources based on your situation, who you're caring for. So always another resource that you can go to um, to get additional support. And it is, again, about how do we stay connected? How do we find purpose and meaning and really foster that wellness in our lives? Um, and that's a challenge right now. You know, that's something that is hard for caregivers to do when you're trying to stay home and not go out. And many programs are closed. And luckily, we've seen a lot more programs offer things online now, which is great. So there's lots of other ways to connect with services and to find activities that can help keep somebody busy. Um, well Connected is a great program that's a telephone-based program. Um, so you don't need to have Internet, um, the person you're caring for doesn't need to have to get online. Um, it's based here in San Francisco and it covers California and then it's a little spotty in different places, but good to, to connect with. They have programs in Spanish. They have some that are specific for LGBTQ older adults. So there's some great kind of diverse options within that, um, but it can be a really good resource. If you are caring for someone with dementia, um, there are some great specific activities you can do with them at home that might help keep them busy and engaged and hopefully are things that would be enjoyable for you as well. Um, the Alzheimer's store is kind of what it sounds like. It's an online store specifically related to dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, and even if you can find some of those products in other places, it can actually spark some really good ideas, and you might find that there's things at home that you can use that you see there. Um, you know, things, again, just simple activities that you can do with somebody at home. Find ways to be creative. These are things that don't require a lot of money. It might mean coloring or arts and crafts that 
Uh, might mean looking at pictures or music. Um, Time Slips is one program that has some great information for caregivers on, cre on using creativity. Um, but this can be a way to both keep yourself busy and to de-stress a little bit. It uses a different part of our brain. Um, there you know, are a whole group of people that are called art therapists, and this is what they do, and there's a reason for it. Um, that the creative arts really can help us shift our brain and our thinking a little bit, and that is something that we often need right now. You may want to reach out to the Area Agency on Aging where you live to find out, are there people that are doing friendly visitor calls? Like, could you a check-in call with the person I'm caring for so I've got some downtime while somebody else is talking to them and checking in? Um, or using a site like Caring Bridge or Lots of Helping Hands, which helps you engage other family members or friends. So you can post updates about what's going on, um, let people know how things are going, but it also can be a way to schedule in help from other people. And right now, that may look like phone calls. Who can call mom or dad or who can call me to check in on how I'm doing on a regular basis? And who are those people that might be part of our circle that we want to engage in that way? Um, number of people uh, and places have put museum tours, um, tours of national parks, um, lots of art online that you can look through, aquariums and zoos. And this can be a good way, again, to keep the person you're caring for busy and engaged during the day. It's something that you might find soothing and relaxing to look at. You know, a lot of people are worried about how do I keep them busy? How do I make sure that they stay active? And well, yes, physical activity is great and important. There are going to be times that having somebody just watch something that is interesting and entertaining and calming may give you the time to do other chores or activities that you need to do. And that's okay. Now is the time to really be patient and kind to yourselves that you don't need to fill every single moment with the most physically and cognitively enriching activities ever. Again, think about what's your capacity, what's your bandwidth, allow yourself some time to have them engaged with something so that you can maybe just be in the other room and take a few deep breaths. Um, be in the other room and make a phone call to a friend so that you can chat for a little bit. So take advantage of some of these online kind of video engagement programs to either have the person do on their own or something to do together. And then really think about what does wellness look like for you? What are the activities that really help you manage your stress? So if you think back to that slide early on that showed the different ways people tend to um, show their stress, whether it's physical symptoms and it's the tension in the shoulders or the back aches or the stomach aches or the, um, it's more mental or emotional or behavioral, Find those activities that correspond with that. So if your stress is very physical, then exercise and yoga might be really helpful because it's going to release some of that tension from your body. If you're a worrier that you've got those thoughts that are just running through your head all the time and you feel really anxious um, and you can't quite quiet down your brain, exercise is still good, not a bad thing to do. But you could be going for a walk and still having those anxious, worried thoughts circling through your brain. So you might want to put on a podcast if you're doing that. Or an activity like reading or journaling might be really helpful for you because it's going to help shift the focus of your brain, shift your thoughts over to something else. Um, if you're a very, if your symptoms tend to be more behavioral, so eating more, not sleeping well, um, again, journaling could be a great one because it's going to help you identify what those patterns are and maybe think about what are ways to change them. Relaxation exercises might be great. Um, if you're more of an emotional person, um, so more irritable and cranky, then anything that helps you kind of relax and ease some of that stress from your body is likely going to help your emotional state as well. So figure out what works for you. And how do you incorporate it into your life in a way that is realistic? 
you don't have a whole day to do something. You can't go out and do anything right now. So what are things that you can incorporate into your life in maybe five minute chunks or 10 minute chunks? Maybe you have to do it, you know, first thing in the day, you're going to start out by doing something for yourself before you have to dive in to caregiving and work and childcare and everything else. Um, maybe you do it at the end of the day. Or if the person you're caring for is taking a nap or there's downtime, you're going to fit it in there. But find a way to fit it in on a regular basis. These things don't make all the stressors, all the challenges, all the difficulties in our life go away. It doesn't stop any of that. But it helps us cope with it. There's an old proverb that says, you can't pour from an empty glass. And you're giving out a lot of your energy all the time. It's finding those things that are nurturing and fulfilling for you that help replenish that energy. Doesn't mean that things aren't so hard, but it improves our capacity to deal with them. So it doesn't mean that we're not still going to be worried about things, but we're more likely to be able to pay attention to our thoughts notice how we're thinking, change those unhealthy thoughts if we've had some time to breathe and relax. So it just helps us cope with it a little bit better. It doesn't make it go away, but it increases our capacity to deal with it. So one of the things that has been floating around a lot on the internet lately that for me is something that is, is soothing and relaxing are the jellyfish cams from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Again, find what works for you, but it's what's soothing, what's relaxing for you that you can fit into your life that are going to help you with your personal well-being. Because when you take care of you, it benefits you, but it also benefits the person that you're caring for. Because you're in a better place to take care of them, you're probably thinking about things more clearly. You're probably a little bit more patient, um, a little less irritable. So your relationship with them is likely to be improved as well. So anytime you have that thought of, okay, I need, if I do these things for myself, it takes away from time I'm spending with them or doing something else for them, realize that it benefits them also. So it's not an act of selfishness to be able to say, I have limits and I need to take care of myself as well. Um, and then just a reminder that Family Caregiver Alliance is here as a resource for you to be able to connect you with services and support, um, to be able to share information and resources that are available, and just to recognize that as a caregiver, you do so much for so many other people in your life. And so it's how do we make sure that you have the support that you need as best as we can um, and to recognize kind of that value of what you are providing and doing. And so with that, um, if there's any questions that have come in, I'm happy to try and answer them as best as I can. Perfect. Thanks, Christina. Uh, we do have a couple of questions and hopefully this will also um, encourage other listeners uh, with their own questions. The first one, I think um, our office has been getting a lot. Uh, I know you're not a, a medical professional, but what would be your advice for someone who's, who might have a family member in a nursing home? They've seen a lot on the news about, you know, what can happen in nursing homes and um, coronavirus. What kind of, mm -hmm. I guess, advice or steps might you recommend in terms of someone thinking about maybe taking, considering taking someone out of a nursing home and care for them in their own home? Yeah. That is a huge issue and definitely one we've had a lot of conversations with um, caregivers on. You know, and I totally understand the instinct to want to bring somebody home. And, you know, for some people that that is their best choice right now if they feel like they have the capacity, the space, the ability to provide that care. I'd say if that's something you're going to do, really reach out to those community services and find out what exists to support you at home. Um, you know, probably there's a there's a good reason why that person was um, moved into a care home or a nursing home. So think about what were those reasons? Do they still exist right now? And is it even possible for us to care for this person at home? And if you think it is, I would say check in with their doctor, talk to them about what their medical needs are so that you 
have a realistic sense of what's available. Um, and then really reach out to those community services to try and put things in place so that you have support. There are some good technologies that can work for trying to communicate with somebody. Um, so obviously if they're able to pick up a phone and call or you know, accept a video chat, you can do that with them. You may need to ask the facility if they could help set that up. Some facilities are willing to help um, you know, answer a video call at a certain time if you want to be able to chat with them. There are some other types of devices. I think it's the Amazon Echo Show that let, has this drop-in feature. So the person on the other end doesn't need to accept the call. You kind of just drop in um, and be able to see each other. But not everybody, um, especially if there's dementia, they're not always able to really interact with screens as well. So that may or may not be a good option. Um, your local ombudsman. So that is a program that acts as advocates for people in long-term care facilities. I'd say connect with them as a resource if you're concerned about quality of care issues. Um, Justice and Aging is a great national resource that's put out some good guides and information around visitation and, and other concerns about facility care. And then it's a California statewide organization, but a lot of the information right now is very relevant nationally. Um, it's called California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, and they have done a couple great webinars and articles that help people understand what their rights are um, around visitation and what some of the concerns and issues are. So that um, is another organization that you might want to take a look at so that you understand what what your options are in terms of visitation, where you can kind of advocate, and what are the things that you might do to make sure that somebody is getting the care that they need. Perfect, thank you. I have um, another question actually that I can answer, and that we will be getting all the slides um, online. We'll get everyone a copy of the slides and a link to view uh, a recording of the webinar after we're able to um, upload it and code it and do all the editing and things. So we will make sure to get a, a copy of the slides to everyone who participated and everyone who also registered. Now, I had another question from a listener. Um, I guess you mentioned journaling and then just would like to get a little bit information mm -hmm. about what exactly that entails. Is it just simply writing in a notebook? Are you supposed to be writing mm -hmm. certain things or what's kind of the, uh, how will you use journaling as, as a tool to, to help you during this time? Yeah, there, there are all sorts of ways to journal, and what's a good thing is that there's no right or wrong way. Um, for some people, that is a little overwhelming because they don't quite know how to start. There are some good guided journals out there, so it gives you prompts. It might be prompts about, you know, what's one thing that went well today, or I feel most anxious when, or I help calm my anxiety when I do this. Um, you can find some of those prompts online, so if you can't, you know, get out to a store to order them or anything, you, you could just use them to get started. Other times journaling is whatever is on your mind. So if you're having those kind of running thoughts that are just circling through your head, it might be okay, I'm gonna start by just writing those down and you know, really kind of just free association, whatever comes to mind. So there's no right or wrong way. It might be more bullet points. It might be just free flowing. It might be prompt. Um, you might, you'll just need to kind of figure out what feels like it's most helpful for you, but it can be a good way to get out some of those worries and those anxious thoughts in your head um, and to be able to view them with a little bit of distance. When you can see it written down, sometimes it helps us evaluate our thoughts a little bit more um, or react to them in a little bit more of an objective way versus when they're just in our heads. Um, so it's a good thing to try and, and yeah, no one way to do it but there are some good kind of prompt journal guides that are online that you can always find if you'd like to. Great, thank you. I've got another question um, from a listener. I guess what might be some of examples of behaviors or um, I guess, yeah, behaviors that might be ways to cope with stress and these feelings of being overwhelmed, but are maybe not so healthy. You've mentioned a number of kind of healthy suggestions. Um, the thing that's come to mind maybe is what they're thinking is something like stress eating. What are, what are maybe some of the mm -hmm. things you would mm -hmm. seek to avoid to, that help us maybe cope but are not necessarily healthy ways of coping? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and some of it is about knowing yourself and kind of what's normal for you. Um, so definitely stress eating can be one. And, you know, we're all going to do that to a point. And so, again, it's noticing, is this every day? Is it a lot different? Is it I'm constantly going for the chocolate or the carbs? Or is this just, you know, now and again, it's maybe not quite as good as I used to do. So, you know, you can be a little, little kind, a little patient with yourself, but just notice if it's something that's coming up a lot. For other people, they're too stressed, they don't even think about eating. Um, and so if you're somebody who tends to be a lighter eater, again, notice if it just seems to be getting more extreme to where it's going to affect your health. Same with sleep. If you're not sleeping at all or you're sleeping too much, both of those at a certain point, not going to be healthy for you. Um, some of the more kind of serious behavioral ones might be an increase in drinking or substance use, whether those are um, illegal drugs or just even medications. Um, those obviously can have some really serious health effects as well as just general life side effects. Um, so really important to kind of notice those. It could be something that we think of as just, oh, I, I'm smoking cigarettes more than I used to. Again, still going to have some health effects for you. And just noticing that this is, no, this is not my normal. This is more problematic than it used to be. Um, and so really paying attention to how you're doing which is hard to do when you're trying to get a million things done during the day and you're focused on another person. So that's where really taking a step back and saying, is this different than what it normally is for me? Am I not coping with things in the same way? Am I having not just, you know, a glass of wine occasionally, but it's every night or now it's two each night or it's three each night. So noticing again, what's normal for you when you start to notice those changes happen um, the more you can introduce some of the more healthy coping um, activities into your life, the better. But sometimes these are things that you really want to talk with your doctor about. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely stress eating more or I'm drinking more or I'm smoking more. Um, I'm getting more angry and irritable. You might want to talk with your doctor that often is a really good reason to talk to a therapist or a counselor. Um, you know, again, these behavioral interventions of more healthy coping skills can be helpful, but often we need outside support. And that is not a sign of weakness in any way, but that's saying, you know, right now I can't do this all on my own and I need a little bit more help. Um, and those are, those are often good warning signs to do that. Thanks. And you mentioned about, and of course, throughout the course of the webinar about seeking help from others and, and maybe and, mm -hmm. um, drawing upon family and friends. Is there a certain way that might be easier or harder to, to go about asking for that help for someone who's maybe not used to having to reach out and um, do something mm -hmm. they think is maybe what their, you know, their own duty should be? Yeah, yeah I think the first part is really been that we are not all as independent as we would like to think we are. Um, I think if this current pandemic has, teaches us anything at the end of it is how interconnected we are as people. And so while we like to think we can do it all on our own, that's not always a possibility. And so it's giving yourself that permission to ask for that help, to really think as concretely as you can, what are the things that people could do for you? And make a list write it down. Could someone bring you groceries or um, help you order them online if you're not really tech savvy? Um, could someone call and chat with, with the person you're caring for? Or could they call and chat with you for a little bit? So if there are people who ask, let me know if you need anything, you can then share with them that list and say, here are some options. Um, if they're able to pick what they want to do, it, they're more likely to do it again. Um, versus if you ask the person who hates cooking to bring you dinner, they may not offer to help again, um, but they might be somebody who is willing to make a run to a grocery store or call to, again, just to see how you're doing. Um, so think about kind of writing this down, allowing people to use their skills and their interests as a way to help you, and they're more likely to, to do it a second time. Um, and to be as clear and specific, especially I think if with other family members who we sometimes wonder, don't they get it? Don't they understand how hard this is? Why are they not stepping up and helping? Sometimes they don't get it. 
If you're the one who's doing it all the time, they may not understand it. So being able to be clear and say, I would really like it if you could call mom for, you know, 10 minutes every day so that I have a little bit of time to, you know, just sit by myself for a bit. Or it would really help me if you could be the one to pull together her health information so that we have it all in one place. Um, because it's something I'm worried about and I have t trouble getting it done during the day. So you have to start by thinking about what do you need help with? What could be helpful for you? And then just give it a shot. And realize, again, not a sign of weakness to say, I can't do it all myself, but to say, this is what's going to allow me to continue caring for this person if I have more help. It will allow me to keep doing this longer um, and do it in a better and sometimes, again, more calm, more patient way if I have this help and support. Perfect. Um... I think we have time for two more questions. One is a listener who'd like to know what your thoughts about uh, in terms of caregivers being involved in advocacy efforts, caregiver advocacy efforts. Is that something you think they might find empowering or a way to find a kind of control, you know, can control their environment a little bit and, you know, feel like they're, they're making a difference? Absolutely. I think there is, such a need for caregivers to really advocate and to share your stories and to be able to say, this is what I'm going through and this is what we need. Um, this is the way we need our systems to change. These are the resources that we need to be improved. Um, you know, there's definitely, you know, organizations like ourselves, um, National Alliance for Caregiving, AARP, Caregiver Action Network. There are some groups that, you know, we're, we're doing that, um, but your voices are more meaningful than any of ours because this is what you're living through every day. And the more you can be involved in advocacy, the better. It might be as simple as a phone call to a state or local representative. Um, it could be letters. Uh, there are sometimes um, more advocacy days that happen. It's definitely opportunities to be involved in that. I know it's hard for caregivers. You're busy. You don't have a lot of time. But think about if there's a way that you can do it. Um, and you're always welcome, again, to reach out to us or to some of those other organizations or reach out directly, again, to your legislators or representatives and tell them, this is what I feel like caregivers need. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of caregivers in this country. Um, the numbers are anywhere between 40 to, you know, 55 million. If everybody starts calling and saying, this is what needs to happen, we might see, see a little bit more improvement in terms of what's available. Perfect. Thanks so much. And it looks like we're just about out of time. I guess um, for the final question, is there, if there's just one or two things that you'd like the caregivers to remember from this presentation, what, um, what might those be? Um, I'd say, you know, the first one is to know that it's important and necessary and a sign of strength to take care of yourself, to reach out for help when you need it. Um, to let people know what you need and how you're doing. And so to really reach out to those supports, whether it's kind of informal family or friends, or it's those um, more formal community-based services, um, but to really prioritize yourself, to not put yourself at the bottom of the to-do list, um, not wait till you've gotten everything done before you say, this is what I need to be healthy and supported as a person and not just a caregiver. Um, so really figure out what is it you need and put that higher on your, your to-do list. Perfect. Thanks so much. So I think that is all the time we have for today. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. We all realize that um, things are very busy, especially for um, these times now where there's a lot going on in, in addition to your caregiving responsibilities. I want to thank our um, co-host and um, co-sponsor, the San Francisco Department of Human Services, the Department of Disability and Aging Services, represented today by Luciana Tsai, and of course, um, Christina Irving for sharing her time with us this afternoon. These webinars will continue on. Um, next week, as I mentioned, we'll be doing a webinar on COVID-19 and caring for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. It will be next week from three to four Pacific time. You can find out all the details on caregiver.org. So again, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Luciana. Thank you, Christina. 
and we wish you all a good afternoon.